Hi, everyone. Welcome to IMAPEC's first webcast of the Corona 360 In Conversation Logistics Live interview series. I'm Kashmira, your host for today, representing IMAPEC Singapore. A little bit about us. IMAPEC strives to be your one-stop shop for biopharmaceutical industry business intelligence and networking opportunities. Over the past 10 years, we have established ourselves firmly as a trusted organizer of high quality biopharmaceutical B2B conferences and exhibitions in the Asia Pacific region and beyond. Over the past six months, we have exponentially expanded our portfolio to include virtual conferences, digital marketing solutions, market research reports, and now our webcast series. Kicking off the start of the series is the discussion on tackling real-time monitoring challenges during flight disruptions. As you know, the COVID-19 situation has affected 4.7 million people worldwide in terms of infections. Pharma industry experts have been facing difficulties such as export and import restrictions and flight disruptions. Flight disruptions in particular require multiple activities being to be conducted under various risks to supply chain experts managing real-time monitoring for specific products and specific markets. This discussion hopes to bring light to some of the key hurdles and strategize possible solutions for them. To all our viewers and to our panelists, thank you all for taking the time out to be with us here today. In addition, I'd like to take a moment to thank our gold sponsor, 7P Solutions. I'd like to share a little bit about 7P Solutions. 7P Solutions is a global leader of real-time GPS tracking and monitoring solutions designed for supply chain visibility and management. 7P was founded in 2010 to provide a unique service offering for the life sciences industry. It is a single platform to be used by quality, compliance, logistics, and loss prevention based on individual user permissions. Today, 7P Solutions has devices operating worldwide, providing visibility of shipments moving via air, ground, and sea, as well as monitoring climate control facilities and vehicles. We are very pleased to have them on board with us today. Today's session will feature an introduction from each interviewee, followed by the panel discussion. Then we'll be having a five minute presentation by 7P Solutions. This will be followed by a Q&A session. You may use the chat feature on the right hand side of your YouTube screen to submit your questions real time. And we shall address them at the end of the panel discussion and presentation. Please note that you will have to have a YouTube account to submit your questions via the chat. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you our moderator and panelists. We have Sanjay Vyas with us here today. Sanjay is currently the Senior Vice President and Managing Director at Paraxel International, which is a global CRO that accelerates clinical trial logistics for biopharmas. He is responsible for the development of strategic direction, leadership, and vision. Sanjay brings over 23 years of experience in global P&L management, logistics and supply chain management, sales and marketing, mergers and acquisitions, operations, and people management. Sanjay, I'd like to hand over the time to you now to tell us a little bit more about yourself, your company, and what you're doing with regards to handling logistics during this COVID-19 crisis. Yeah, thank you, Kashmira, and uh, hello to everyone. Uh, so as Kashmira introduced, my name is Sanjay Vyas, and I'm representing Parksville International out here. Uh, as a part of uh, clinical trial supplies and logistics business unit, we are responsible to manage the entire um, uh, drug supply, ancillary supplies, and anything that is needed for today to conduct a clinical study uh, with our patients, uh, all the way from 
uh, the manufacturing to uh, the investigator sites uh, at any given point in time. Uh, uh, Paracel International is a leading global CRO, as you rightly mentioned, one of the clinical research organizations. Uh, and our entire focus on conducting studies is with the patient, uh, uh, with, with the patient centricity in the mind uh, uh, from that perspective. Uh, and and uh, it's interesting that, uh, honestly speaking, there are some real challenging times at this point of time going on with COVID. Uh, um, as as we are, we are getting into this pandemic, something which I, at least in my lifetime, had never experienced. And I think many of us have never experienced this. Uh, it's almost like going through a movie, right? You know, uh, uh, in, in real life. And, and that's what the situation is. But I think the most important part for us at this point of time uh, that we uh, are looking at from this pandemic situation was the total disruption that it led to suddenly, because we are technically into a service where uh, we are uh, connecting with people and patients on a very regular basis, uh, not only with patients, but even the investigator sites. So technically, uh, there's a lot of uh, people interaction and there's a lot of uh, uh, connectivity that's involved. Plus, this, the most important part is the entire clinical logistics or the clinical trial industry is driven by very highly regulated compliance because we are dealing with drugs that today are not yet approved into the market. It's unlike a finished product where you know everything is approved. It's it's approved by the FDA. It's approved. Uh, the compliance has been set in place. Um, you can you can follow a particular pattern of set of supply chain. But but what happens is in a drug development process, you're dealing with a molecule and diseases that where this cure is not yet there. Um, and in, in those circumstances, the level of compliance has become very, very important. And traditionally, this entire drug development industry um, is driven by this compliance procedures and regulations, which always had, a, uh, I would not say kind of a hindrance, but it's always had been a challenge to navigate through this industry as compared to the finished products. Uh, and that's where the challenge comes in. And then to add to that, when COVID happened, um, in, uh, because you know when the drug has been dispensed to a patient, you don't know. Uh, yes, there is some rigorous test that has been conducted in the phase one part, early phase piece of it on animal testing before it comes to the human testing piece of it. But still, there is a risk involved. You don't know what how the drug is going to react on particular patients, and that's why uh, the regulations become much much more difficult. Uh, the paperwork required, the compliance requirement, the, the procedures, the uh, main, making sure that the efficacy of the drug by the time it reaches in the hands of the patient is, is maintained accurately and appropriately is very, very high uh, in this industry. And, hence, and that's why, uh, as I said, when COVID happened and suddenly, in addition to these regulatory pressures, when COVID happened, the kind of pressure uh, mounted almost threefold because literally everything almost came to pretty much like a halt uh, at that perspective. But it's interesting. I think the good part is uh, there are some good, interesting mitigation strategies that uh, Parkcell as an organization has been able to implement to uh, continue to conduct the study because our entire focus was how do we ensure that the patients who are today recruited on this studies continue to get their medication? How do we make sure that um, we don't lose because there are there are many studies who have been being conducted for the last one, two, three years period of time. And normally the life cycle of any study is between three to five to seven years eh, before your drug even comes back to, into the market after the finish. So many of the studies were almost halfway through. So ensuring that we do not lose what has happened in the past and we yet continue to uh, make sure has been some of those challenges that uh, we have been dealing with. So. That's a quick introduction from my end, and I'm looking definitely forward to this interesting conversation with the team of expert panelists we have out here. Um, so maybe over back to you, Kashmira. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, so I'll introduce the next panelist we have, uh, Roslyn. Roslyn Lee is the Associate Director of uh, Distribution and Logistics Operations at MSD. She leads the Asia Pacific Transportation Team which is responsible for ensuring the efficient and innovative transportation of products while meeting the regulatory service and business requirements. She is also responsible for coordinating strategic, st strategic logistic initiatives, as well as budget and financial planning. Rosalind, I'd like to hand over to you uh, to tell us a little bit more about yourself, uh, MSD, and how uh, you are dealing with external logistics operations during this COVID-19 uh, crisis. 
Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. So uh, my name is Rosalie. So I'm with MSD for four years, heating the transportation. So I believe, um, I'm not sure what to introduce about MSD. For me, is MSD is an innovative global company, pharmaceutical. So our focus has always been patient first. So during this COVID-19, our objective and main vision is not to miss a single dose to patient. So we are lucky that we have great sponsorship um, in terms of making fast decisions and um, budget uh, initiative of uh, control to all the regional leads um, on this area. So <clears throat> we have a lot of challenges. So basically for my scope, I'm taking care of um, global transportations. Anything that come in and out of Asia Pacific or in trial visit will be under my care. So our biggest challenge now is the disruptions to the supply chain of supplying medications to including APIs, um, bulk and final finished products uh, to, to manufacturing sites and to our patients. So um, looking forward to all your questions. We will I will try to answer my best. Thank you so much, uh, Rosalind. So moving forward, we have Sudhir with us. Sudhir Mohan Bansal is the Vice President and India Head of Supply Chain uh, at Pfizer. He is an accomplished business transformation leader and an astute strategy deployment and innovation practitioner in supply chain operations and customer excellence. He has deep knowledge in all related fields of um, supply chain, including planning, procurement, inventory, warehousing, logistics, distribution, as well as commercial. So Sudhir, I'd like to hand over to you now to uh, share a little bit about yourself, as well as um, Pfizer and how you've been dealing with supply chain management uh, during this COVID-19 period. Oh uh, yeah, thanks uh, Kashmira. I think uh, you have uh, briefed my profile already. So like my name is Sudhi Bansal. I have been uh, Vice President uh, India Operation Pfizer and uh, I have been working out there for almost five years. Uh, as uh, Kashmira said, I am shouldering end to end responsibility. That is something which is very, very important uh, in terms of supply chain, starting from order forecasting, planning, purchasing, inventory, up to the logistics, including that of warehousing. Uh, my company, uh, which have, uh, as you know, 50 billion US dollar as a group, uh, uh, we are in India manufacturing uh, 500 million injectables, 2 billion of solid dosages, apart from API, out of uh, uh, four uh, state of art uh, EOU plants uh, that is you know, uh, spread across the country. Uh, we are catering domestic as well as export market. I am essentially, you know, uh, uh, related to exports because uh, uh, it is something which is uh, related to se several medicines which are uh, required in US. So we are completely supplying to US and UK and rest of the rest of the world. Uh, apart from, you know, the one of the opportunities that I carry is basically apart from pharmaceutical, I have been an opportunity to work with the sub leading organization in automobile and uh, uh, consumer goods namely Honda, GM, Xerox, Fiat, and uh, then now Pfizer. Uh, so definitely it's a very thrilling journey for the last uh, three decades uh, that I have been actually into. Uh, yes, uh, you know, for the last couple of months, we have witnessed a lot of uh, things stand still. Uh, nobody knows as to how to go, how is going to happen or something like that. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the India is not an exception because uh, that is something which we have also been feeling what US or other uh, you know, countries uh, in the world are uh, you know, experiencing. Uh, having said that, what I wanted to say while uh, it's a completely lull for two months because of COVID-19 lockdown, uh, we in India have an opportunity to uh, open and uh, work for pharmaceutical company though in a, you know, a bit uh, lesser capacity, but nevertheless, it is happening. Uh, so that's it uh, as far as the introduction and my company for me is concerned. Uh, I will be looking forward for some specific questions during the poll. Thank you, Sudhir. Uh, now we have Derek with us. As Vice President of Global Business Development at 7P Solutions, Derek's 
uh, Derek, mentioned, uh, sorry, Derek manages key accounts and acquires new customers and business partners. He has been instrumental in the development of 7P's RootWatch platform, as well as the establishment of 7P's pharma and cargo security solutions. So I'd like to hand over the time now to Derek to uh, share a little bit about yourself, uh, 7P Solutions, as well as uh, the real-time monitoring work that you're currently doing with regards to the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, Kashmir. So, um, hi everybody, I'm Derek Middleton, uh, Vice President of Global Business Development here, 7P Solutions. We are a real-time GPS monitoring um, company. We provide devices and platform uh, along with, you know, advice with our combined 40 plus years of transportation. Obviously, 40 years, not just me, um, but uh, combined. And, you know, the key for our system and our platform is really that, that real-time aspect. So being able to see a shipment monitor temperature variations and deviations and being able to react to those in a real-time manner uh, via our exception-based platform, which we call RouteWatch. Um, it's an internet-enabled um, platform that's accessible on any mobile or computer uh, with internet access. One of the, the biggest challenges that we've seen with the COVID uh, pandemic or situation going on is not directly related to us, but more of supporting and being there for our clients, uh, making sure that we are able to meet the demand of increased devices for temperature monitoring for medications or um, being able to coordinate their shipments and find out if there's flight delays and, and have that information readily available without needing to contact airlines and freight forwarders and different uh, folks of that nature. So that's what been our biggest goal is just maintaining our, our uptime and our support for our customers. So they are able to move those life-saving drugs, products, medical equipment, and not have those disruptions in their supply chain or, or be able to react to that disruption because you know there's what, over 9,000 flights a week that, have, uh, that are being delayed. So it's important to have that visibility. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Derek. Uh, last but not least, we have Larry. Uh, Larry Singer is a key consultant at the US Department of Health and Human Service, and he handles law and supply chain projects. So Larry, I'd like to hand over the time to you right now uh, to share a little bit about yourself and how you are currently dealing with the COVID-19 crisis. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, I'm sorry. I should have, we should have. Um, I should have discussed this beforehand, but I did notice you used the United States Department of Health and Human Services logo, and you just mentioned the United States Department of Health and Human Services. And the one thing that I do need to make clear to everybody, all the participants, is that um, I do not represent as as far as this conference goes. I do not represent the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and I can only speak in the capacity of myself as somebody who has been a consultant for 44 years. Um, so I just wanted to make that very clear that this, is, this can't be a, a discussion about what the US Health and Human Services is going through. Um, that having been said, I have been a consultant for 44 years. I work with clients all around the world handling temperature and time sensitive shipments going in both directions. I am um, aware of and have used many of the solutions that my colleagues have mentioned for monitoring um, where things are, what temperature conditions are being experienced, um, expediting pro uh, products that are temperature sensitive that, that have gotten stuck somewhere. They always seem to get stuck, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> they always seem to get stuck on the tarmac, of course, for the longest period of time, depending on how cold the shipment needs to be. And so I've worked with a variety of solutions, which I look forward to sharing with everybody today 
as to how to uh, move shipments, keep them moving, keep them on time. Um, as was mentioned, uh, knowing where they are at any given time. And also uh, talking with everybody about how things have slowed down and how shipments have become difficult now that there just aren't many flights operating. And what the airlines have a lot of experience that I can speak about as to what the airlines are doing in order to improve the availability of freight movement around the world and make it, uh, make it done at a reasonable cost. So thank you for the introduction and I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Larry. So now that we have all been acquainted with each other, uh, let's begin the panel discussion. So I have a question that um, I'd like to pose to all of you. Um, could you share some challenges? I know a couple of you have already highlighted this uh, during your introductions, uh, but specifically, could you share some challenges that you and your team are facing currently with regards to pandemic uh, efforts to handle uh, you know, unpredictable schedules, increased timelines, and uh, you know, efforts to optimize costs uh, in this situation, um, as well as you know, whatever uh, uh, solutions that you guys have uh, been looking at uh, to tackle these uh, challenges, if at all. So uh, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, Sanjay, uh, shall we start with uh, you? Uh, we'll be more than happy to share this. Uh, let me try and summarize uh, a few of the, because um, as I said, uh, uh, in a steady conduct, uh, it is important that many of the patients visit the investigator sites. The drugs have to be available at that point of time for the drugs to be dispensed to the patients. As soon as the pandemic hit, I think the biggest priorities across all the countries and all the governments was, uh, the focus was purely on the COVID-19 infected patients. Apparently what happened is uh, uh, many of these investigator sites uh, started closing their doors to the regular patients uh, and the studies that were being conducted. I think the, um, because it was a clear direction that the priority was given to the COVID infected PM patients and, um, and, and everybody was focusing on trying to uh, deal with those. So that was one challenge. The sites, apparently the investigative sites uh, uh, kind of got close to the studies piece of it. The second is uh, the pharmacy capacity was limited. So technically when the drugs were being shipped, uh, there was limited capacity out to deal. The nurses on emergency plans, uh, uh, most of those doctors and nurses, they were so focused uh, that their entire span of attention moved to uh, one single area uh, of, uh, of, of, of that uh, uh, perspective. And then the, the biggest challenge that came in was the patient protective equipment. Now, so far, we are just talking about not just the drugs now, but drugs, ancillaries, and now the patient protective equipment became an important part of this whole study conduct because patients were not allowed to come into the sites or the sites were not allowed to treat the patients if they did not have the proper uh, productive equipment. So it was just not about shipping IMP, but it, is ship it was shipping of IMP and uh, PP equipment also to the investigator sites became um, an interesting challenge. Now, from a patient perspective, the challenges that we faced was they got restricted mobility. As you know, many countries went into a lockdown state. Like I can give you an example in India, it was a total lockdown here in India. Suddenly overnight, it was declared by the prime minister and then everything came to a standstill. Same thing happened in many parts of the world as the infection started uh, growing. Um, so that restricted the mobility of the patients. So technically now the patients could not come to the site to get the drugs. Uh, and that's where the challenge. So then we need to start thinking about, okay, how do we make sure that those drugs are then delivered to the patients um, from that perspective? Uh, the, the, the other challenge was the uh, even if the patients were able to make it to the site, the increased infection risk at the site also was another challenge that came in. And then last but not the least, I think that's what the core top discussion piece of it is the regulatory and trade. And the reason I'm giving you the site and the patient perspective is because you can link this up that the site challenges, the patient challenges and the regulatory and trade challenges, they are all linked to each other. Uh, and from a regulatory and trade perspective, the biggest challenge came was the clinical and healthcare regulatories um, had their limited focus because most of these authorities were so focused on driving the COVID-19 situation that uh, um, uh, at least from a clinical perspective, we were struggling to understand that what are the new clinical guidelines, what are the new trial guidelines that we need to follow 
in order so that we can have the drugs uh, reach to the patients and we can continue those uh, those studies accordingly. The second biggest challenge from a regulatory and trade perspective was that the borders got closed down. Um, and when the borders got closed, the challenge came across from a global trade perspective. So not only uh, many countries restricted many of the carriers coming into their borders, even though some countries were still allowing the domestic carriers to work uh, like in US, there were still domestic carriers uh, going between East Coast to West Coast, but in Europe, there were some flights that were operating between certain countries, but there were still a lot number of countries and boundaries that were closed, uh, like in China, in India, a uh, couple of those countries literally put a complete close down on any kind of passenger aircrafts or freighters coming into um, into the into the boundaries. Um, and that led to the second challenge of the uh, trade regulatory limitations. The third piece is, uh, I think Derek mentioned about it, uh, which was apparently 7,000 aircrafts on ground, right? Uh, at, at, within a span of a couple of days across many countries. Uh, so the supply chain challenges mounted up because of this uh, um, aircraft on ground situation, because we just literally had no option uh, for the drugs to move uh, from that perspective. So, and so while I've summarized some of these challenges at a pretty high level, uh, some of the mitigation strategies that Parkcell as an organization started looking and we as a team came together because uh, what we came together was uh, for, for us, there were two challenges. One, how do we continue to make sure that we conduct the study in the most compliant manner, uh, follow all the MHA uh, GCP guidelines uh, that are needed to make sure that we don't lose out on any of the data because data is very important as you're conducting the study. And second is while we are doing that, how do we mitigate, how do we develop a mitigation strategy? Because just conducting a study or just having a patient um, uh, participate in a study or just having a clinical monitor is not going to help because if the drug is not available, then how do you even conduct the study, right? So we started thinking about developing a mitigation strategy from a supply chain logistics perspective. Um, one of the most important part that we started pushing off was an early inclusion of supply chain into the study strategy development. So as new studies were onboarding and as the current studies were going, uh, uh, we literally sat on the table and we said that supply chain team needs to have a seat on the table when you're discussing the patient strategy around that. So technically we can tell you that if you are planning to send and do a study in let's say uh, three countries in Asia, five countries in Europe, uh, two countries in Latin America, then from a logistics perspective, is it going to be feasible? What are the challenges that are going to come across? Um, so th that's, that's what we started laying down. So that early inclusion into the strategy piece helped. The second is um, in this whole discussion, having a regulatory expertise on the team was also important because um, as I said, it's not just about getting the drug from place A to place B. Uh, the challenge was uh, when you're getting it from place A to place B or country A to country B, the regulatory requirement in each of the countries were totally different. Uh, some countries had even put a total restriction of any kind of pharmaceutical uh, drugs to be shipped out because everybody was panicking whether we would have shortage of those drugs within our countries as well. And I think those were the, uh, so that's why having a regulatory expert on the team was going to be of critical importance as we were developing the supply chain strategy. Uh, and the last piece was uh, um, how do we increase the, the, the sourcing flexibility as well? So one is uh, we literally had to turn every stone around, start looking at what are the alternatives of shipping that are available today on the market? How do we make sure that the efficacy of the drug is uh, maintained all throughout the life cycle, right from the moment the drug leaves our depot and goes to the investigator site, and then from the investigator site, it's handed to the patient. How do you make sure that the drug has not lost its efficacy, maintained in its required integrity? Uh, so that's, that's the piece. And then the last piece was the sourcing, because in many cases, um, you had to work on a sourcing strategy because in a clinical study, you're not only working on the actual molecule, which is manufactured by the sponsor, but you're also working with comparator drugs, like the drugs so that they can compare the study between the molecule and the existing drug in the market. So how do you continue to source those comparator drugs? Because the comparator drugs were now needed in respective countries. Everybody was, every country was trying to hold the source stock. So how do you make sure that piece and then the last one, which was the most important part of this strategy was 
since the patients could not come, since the investigator sites were focusing on that, how do we develop a virtual trial strategy? And that's where we focused on. Uh, and virtual trials was like, so instead of having a site-to-site -site strategy, instead of having a patient visit the investigator site, how can you develop a virtual trial strategy that is revolving around patient centricity? And the couple of solutions that we started looking at was the direct-to-patient supply chains for both the drugs and the ancillaries. And in fact, that was the most important part of making sure that the steady continuity was happening. Many of our clinical monitors, instead of doing a physical site monitoring, they started doing remote monitoring. So using tools like telehealth, video conferencing, um, our clinical monitors were doing virtual trials while our supply chain guys were focused on making sure that the drug uh, using the direct to patient strategy um, the supply chain was integrated and in making sure that the drugs were reaching the patient's home. But that was just not enough. Combining the direct-to-patient supply chain along with home nursing, um, wearables integration. So many of those uh, things or the technologies that we thought in the past were just adjacency suddenly became the core of the strategy. So devices that would help us track uh, the medication compliance. Are we using the right packaging that will allow us technologically uh, enable us to monitor that the patients are, are doing the drug medication, uh, the patients are, the drugs are maintained in the right temperature or not with the patient or not. Uh, so all of that stuff became, so suddenly technology, direct to patient, home nursing, all of that put together uh, became a core part of the supply chain strategy from uh, overall perspective. So that's the uh, a very high level bird's eye view of the challenges from sites, patients, regulatory trade, and some of the mitigation strategies uh, that we as an organization uh, uh, had tried to implement. I hope that helps, Kashmira. Yeah, that, uh, quite a comprehensive uh, you know, overview of uh, you know, the challenges that you guys have faced. But, um, I see that you guys actually uh, have, you know, come up with strategies to actually mitigate them, and one of which um, does involve a lot of technology, a lot of, uh, you know, monitoring of uh, temperature real time, um, which you know kind of ties into uh, Derek and his uh, company, Seven uh, P Solutions, with their real time, uh, you know, uh, monitoring equipment. So um, yeah, very very interesting stuff. Um, I'd also like to, you know, ask uh, Roslyn, you know, what uh, challenges uh, she's been facing uh, with regards to, you know, the unpredictable schedules and the um, increased cost, I'm, I'm sure, you know, at this point. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So, there's a lot of challenges. Actually, most of it, San Sanjay has said it, like, um, let's start with budget because I'm the budget owner for the transportation piece. So it's a big challenge how you how you manage uh, the increased spend and justify your increased spend to all your top management. So we, we do have a special um, models that uh, we have daily calls with all our major supply chain partners. And uh, we do fast decision there. Yes, no, yes, no. So the focus is always on the output. The good thing about us is we have very strong sponsorship. So the objective is never miss a dose, patient first. So anything that money can solve is not an issue. <laughs> so, so it's very important you have strong sponsorship from, from your senior leadership team. And um, we have representative from all regions. So we keep we try to keep the call vein. And it's also very important you get the correct stakeholders in all these decision-making calls. So like what Sanjay has said, we have people from regulatory, people from procurement, and people from trade compliance, and people from the quality team. So, we have to make a lot of fast decision in the call uh, and to, to secure the space and everything. So the governance and cadence is very important during this period of time. And that's number one. And we split the whole supply chain um, into, we actually have a, a weekly global dashboard to show everybody what is the international for air, ocean, what are the challenges we face. And we also have um, origin, like certain political restrictions, some countries, they have certain drugs. Um, they need how you tackle, um, you need to have sufficient uh, particular drugs for your country before you can export up. So we, 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 we keep having all this discussion across all the regions and how, what are the, what are the leeways that we can do backup solutions. Uh, we, we have a lot of BCP. This period, we came up with a lot of business continuum plan, alternative sources, backup plans, and um, multi-model models using cross-stock ocean air. 
you name it, we have it now. <laughs> so, and also we also have a weekly calls cadence on um, possible charter solutions. So we would uh, reinforce all our forecasting and put uh, all the products, what are the level of urgencies of rating. Uh, we work with sites and, uh, and markets, patients that for certain critical products that need special attention, how we do our routing and stuff. And we also have industrial collab uh, collaboration. We have um, Fort Miami calls actually conduct during US, uh, which is led by my US uh, transportation lead. calls with people like Bayer, Pfizer, BMS. So we have a global collaboration call with all the different uh, big boys in, in the pharmaceutical market to, to see if there's any possible charter, joint charter that we can do together to ease the solution. So we do have our own challenge. Like if air can't, we go ocean. If ocean can't, we look at multimodal. If multimodal can't, we go charter, which is the, the most expensive. So we have certain uh, priority. <clears throat> Track and trace is also one of key. That's good thing. There's silver lining uh, uh, in all clubs, okay? So the good thing for MSD is we managed to push across a lot of projects which are still in testing trials and proof of concept, like um, certain packing technologies, uh, pack up technologies like uh, we currently partner with SkyCell to replace all the active containers for certain uh, of our critical products because active containers become a uh, pretty pain for air freight uh, due to the returns and, and everything and the cost. So certain panel, uh, those that are still in qualification, we manage to push through and uh, certain process bureaucracy, we simplify. So it's actually a good period that um, we manage to push through certain things. Okay. We also have a tracking Yeah, yeah. Uh, Roslyn, uh, actually, you mentioned that um, you're working with SkyCell uh, to, you know, you know, in terms of your active container uh, replacement. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, some uh, technical issue. The active container now. Is is a big challenge for the every industry. So um, we replace a lot of our active container with a uh, uh, different support uh, technologies uh, to protect our products. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, and I, I wanted to elaborate a little, um, have you elaborate a little bit about that? Uh, you know, in terms of the partnerships and collaboration aspect, you know, with their various third parties, um, you know, uh, concerning tackling real-time monitoring uh, oh. and site disruptions, uh, you know, perhaps you could share a little bit more about that. Okay, we do have our own what we call digital logistic, uh, digital logistic team. We have our own real-time monitoring platform. Uh, we call it uh, code. Um, we do have few partners like uh, Controllance, Transvoyance, uh, you name it. Uh, some of them are still under proof of concept, but during this period, we push everything uh, through, which is also a good thing. And we have live, uh, live monitoring. The most important about live monitoring is, uh, for us, is deviation and exception management. So what's the point of having real-time uh, information if, if something happens, you do not know what to do and your partners do not know what to do? So we, we have a full suit of exception handling if, Certain things happen at origin. Uh, what are your partners supposed to do and everything and all the distributing and contact list. So it, it, it was a very, very robust process that it took a lot of people effort. Like uh, in our internal organization, we call the regulatory, same thing, the quality people, what are the correct um, interventions and what are the interventions that we can take at different points in the supply chain. So that is the most important for us right now on um, where we come up with all the business process and, and work instructions on the interventions that we can take. And it also allows us to, the quality people, if there is really a temperature excursion, we get all the deviation memo and everything in advance so that uh, all your disposition statements and everything investigation can be do 
really, really fast. Because sometimes when we ship even slight uh, deviations, in, 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 there's a lot of paperwork in the pharmaceutical to get your product release, quality release. So with all this real-time monitoring, you have live information to support all your, all your quality deviation and, and, and chain control memo to get your product released with supporting docs. So decision can be made faster. Intervention, correct intervention process can be done. So this are, um, we do have a lot of partners. So it's very important you have a solid process in place um, with all your strategy partners like uh, like for us with the right one. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Roslyn. Uh, Sudhir, how about, how about you, uh, you know, with uh, Pfizer? Um, what are some of the challenges that you guys have uh, been uh, facing, especially with regards to, uh, you know, the flight disruptions um, and, and, you know, trying to get everything online? Yeah, shortly, Kashmira, I mean, uh, uh, the various points that had been touched by Rosalina and uh, Sanjay, but uh, what I just wanted to touch upon the kind of challenge that we have been facing is essentially, you know, the air flights, right? Uh, as you all know, in pharmaceutical, especially the air uh, freight is almost uh, six to eight times than sea shipment, and therefore we always rely on the sea shipment. But given the kind of you know situation that we are in, sea shipment is something uh, we just cannot manage because many of the calls which are coming are very very urgent, and therefore we have to look at air. Now, having said that, air again is divided into you know the cargo shipment, the cargo air and uh, you know the passenger uh, i should say cargo air is something more or less is okay because uh, sometimes dhl and fedex those are you know dedicated uh, uh, you know cargo planes which are running uh, although there are interference from the government side as to what kind of item they need to carry uh, but apart from it, the major portion of uh, air freight space is actually with the passenger air, uh, air uh, cargo. Now, since all these passenger flights are uh, more or less closed, uh, at least for India, you know, for the last two months, there is uh, absolutely no flight is coming and uh, or going. And therefore, uh, it has uh, a major bottleneck. Uh, what my company is also, you know, thinking and what I actually foresee, this kind of situation is not only now, but it is going to exist for longer period. And uh, especially in case of uh, domestic flight or, uh, you know, international flight, there is a possibility that two passengers will be, you know, sitting while one pas uh, passenger seat in the middle will be kept empty. Or there may be some kind of, you know, layout that would be, you know, giving a fairly, uh, you know, substantial gap between the two passenger. And that actually mean that overall passenger capacity is going down. And therefore, airline would be actually pinning hopes for expanding the cargo space, which is a belly hold space uh, is there. Now, since uh, we have to rely on this kind of space from the our uh, pharmaceutical industry perspective, we need, we have started, you know, several things, uh, how to cope up with this kind of, you know, situation. Uh, one is basically like our planning team has started uh, doing a lot of, you know, exercise uh, using, uh, you know, AI technology or, you know, close coordination with the marketing team as to make most of the cargo sea uh, ship bound instead of air. And therefore, we are targeting as at least 10 to 12 percent of year. We want to take it maybe six or seven percent. That is what because it's going to be pretty high in terms of cost, and there are delay bound to happen because uh, you know transit point or routing would also be severely uh, you know damaged. The second thing which we have started doing is uh, asking our packaging development department. Uh, to start exploring possibility to how to reduce the overall package, uh, you know, size using, uh, you know, uh, a special material, which will be less bulky or less voluminous or weightage. Also, you know, some extra layers which are there in the packaging need to be removed, yet the quality need to be intact. 
the other thing which i we were also thinking uh, thinking about uh, packaging and logistic uh, perspective is that instead of uh, sending small packages to a small uh, you know uh, different different uh, uh, consigners consignees we want to you know put together all small package into the big uh, package so that volume wise we can get an advantage and also in terms of uh if we will be saving that much cost that will be you know uh, very beneficial because if it will be going to a regional warehouse say for example in case of us and over there it will be sorted or unpacked and then redistributed through the truck uh the cost which will be incurred out there will be much much lesser than what our air freight cost is so at the moment uh, the company is you know very very fine tuning the the total way as to how to overcome and the kind of strategy that we are meant uh, uh, for covid 19 today and the post situation because we believe it is going to stay for a year or two and many of the people are saying that it is going to be a part of our life so we are creating some kind of you know new normal uh, for uh, you know in order to cope up with the, this uh, flight disruption Uh, you know uh, i i just want to add on to that in terms of like um this being the new normal um how do you foresee uh supply chain systems you know uh, of the future uh you know because right now we are taking a very reactive approach because we've never seen such a uh, situation a pandemic and so um in terms of preparing uh for possible future pandemics uh you know taking a more proactive approach in making supply chains more resist uh, resilient um you know uh, perhaps you could share a little bit about that you know what you foresee for uh you know uh for this yeah as i said like uh, we are highly concentrating on the total packaging development so that you know the overall volume can get used apart from it you know we are also thinking because ours is you know big company and uh, we always uh, take the leverage of uh, low inventory at various places where we supply now based upon this we are also thinking to increase our inventory level a little bit more uh, because uh, you know the flight and the sea shipment all those are you know sometimes find lot of you know bottlenecks or roadblocks and therefore the consignment which is meant to reach by sea say 52 days which is a benchmark time and 3 uh, days in case of air including that of customs and all these may be delayed a little bit and therefore we are increasing on our inventory level uh, at all the places what we actually realized that if we will be increasing a bit uh, more inventory in terms of a week or so uh, the cost inventory carrying cost will be lesser compared to what we end up uh, paying uh, you know uh, high cost as far as uh, air air airlines are concerned and also many of the time if it is going to be the stock out situation there will be lot of you know political kind of embargo would happen so in order to that a packaging development to make the package smaller b you know the planning team will have to cope up with the you know the situation and therefore they have to do overwork as to which material need to be there because please understand if we will be following the same kind of you know guideline that we used to do and the material is going and then ultimately it will be used and as sanjay has pointed out sometime what happened the general medicine uh, medication is taking now nowadays a back seat whereas covid 19 related uh, you know things are coming up uh, as a top priority so what happened like if we will be following the same kind of you know forecasting model maybe we will not be in a position to you know uh, supply those medication which are required for covid 19 so that's the kind of strategy that my company is thinking about all right thank you so much uh, sudhir um derek how about you guys uh, at 7p solutions you know what are the uh, I'm, i'm sure you you are keeping up to date with uh, your partners Uh, on the ongo- uh, ongoings of the pharma supply chain industry so uh, perhaps you can share some of your views on the challenges that uh, you and your team are facing as well as the uh, partners that you are working uh, with uh, regarding the flight disruptions yeah so you know 
my take on it, my, my side is a little bit different than everybody else here is a, you know, a service provider. Um, our challenges, you know, primarily have been really related to, um, you know, staging devices, manufacturing delays due to shutdowns all over the globe. Um, having an influx of customers that are trying to find different ways to, to maintain uh, with love their supply chain with the ever growing changes in routing and um, you know flight delays and cancellations. Um, the importance of that visibility factor has been heightened because of everything going on uh, with COVID. So some of our biggest challenges is really just bringing in on a very tight schedule, uh, new customers, new departments, and really getting them up to speed and teaching them how to use our tools and, um, you know, and, and how to implement that because with our system, there's a lot of different things that, that touch the supply chain as far as visibility and, and who can use it um, as far as, or as well as, you know, integrating into existing systems uh, with the API and automatically feeding that data into their systems so they have that visual visual tool without needing to learn or really update a, a different system from um, you know just getting that feed of information you know from a partner's perspective uh, we see a lot of the same issues that uh, that everybody else has been talking about with uh, changes in the scheduling and routing capabilities um, restrictions on the size or, or what you can ship or, or the capacity of the planes. Um, and the biggest challenge with that or the, the, what we try to provide to them is the tools to not counteract that, but to adjust to it and to figure out a better way to, you know, to accomplish what, what they need to accomplish uh, given the changes in, in today's uh, supply chain. So, I don't have the exact same challenges as everybody here does, but from a supply chain perspective, we definitely feel the pressure, um, you know, with the, you know, just, just like I said, with, with everything going on, uh, our focus and what we're doing is just being scalable, having that flexibility to, you know, work remotely or, you know, my, one of my personal challenges that, that, uh, that I'm seeing is everybody else adjusting to working from home or working in a remote environment and learning how to work together. Um, so having as many tools, uh, making your supply chain as smart as you can, uh, it really seems to help and, and just alleviate some of that stress and that pressure. Um, you don't have to, you know, as Rosalind mentioned uh, with, with her team, they have, um, you know, a team of experts and, and that's what we provide to our customers is that same visibility, that same ability to know if there's a deviation or if a package gets open and you have a light sensor alert, you're able to see exactly where that's happening. Maybe it's a, you know, a, a shipper getting reconditioned um, or, or transferred into a, a new, sh new, new shipping container because, you know, that uh, 72 hour, 96 hour pack out is no longer valid. So they need to transfer that and then how do they do that with the tools uh, that we provide um, on our system and, and with our team. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Larry. So um, we're just going to uh, take a minute here. Um, thank you, everyone, you know, for sharing uh, about the challenges that you guys have faced. Um, it uh, was very insightful. Uh, I'd like to take a moment now to uh, share a short presentation that Derek's uh, colleague, Jeff, uh, put together about uh, their latest supply chain management innovation. Um, and we will then, following the presentation, resume uh, the discussion, uh, as well as uh, you know, have our Q&A segment. Uh, a few viewers have sent in some questions. So I'll be asking uh, those questions to you uh, following the presentation.
Well, good morning. Again, my name is Jeff Clark with 7P Solutions. Uh, we founded the company back in 2010. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing uh, tackling real-time uh, monitoring challenges during flight uh, disruptions. Um, as we are all aware, since uh, uh, COVID-19 began, uh, there's been over 9,000 flights canceled weekly around the uh, globe. Um, this obviously is placing more stress on the supply chain than we have ever experienced um, in my 30 years in global transportation. Uh, not only does it increase uh, the chance of temperature excursions, it also increases potential for loss uh, or stolen product. Um, I think what I'm going to discuss then over the next couple of slides is how does technology add value to the challenges that we see today. So 7P Solutions provides a supply chain intelligence using a combination of software, which is our route watch platform and GPS hardware. Uh, these are two important points when considering uh, supply chain visibility. The way we break that down is with our, our route watch uh, software uh, platform, which is an internet based platform. Um, it's a shipment management platform that is GDP compliant. Uh, it's built for event based monitoring so that we are monitoring by exception only. Um, we monitor real-time hours against carton validation. Uh, so meaning if you're utilizing 96 hour validated cartons, as it gets close to the end of that validation, uh, users will be alerted to that fact. Um, it's gotta be a simple system, uh, easy to use. So we, we built the platform based on product protocols as well as shipment protocols, um, which we find eliminates or reduces errors uh, when shipping personnel are, are creating shipments. Uh, all the data is maintained for five years in the platform uh, so that it can be used for trending, uh, looking at problem areas and things of that nature. Uh, we utilize real-time GPS um, and that is backed up with cell tower ID tracking uh, in the event that the GPS signal is lost. Uh, these are really a combination of two of the most accurate ways to, to track uh, product. Um, the device I have shown here is our GD100. It was designed specifically for the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, it's a di disposable device uh, that eliminates the need for reverse logistics, which is challenging for companies. Um, it has a 30 day activation from the time it's turned on, it will automatically deactivate 30 days later. This gives us plenty of time should a shipment be lost or there be customs hold within the supply chain. Uh, there is a temperature excursion LED on the device, uh, which will indicate to the person receiving the shipment that there has been a problem. Um, if uh, there's a communications error, there's also a communication light that would indicate to the receiver that uh, there has been some communications lost. We all know the experience of using our cell phones inside of some facilities. We don't have a cell phone signal. So what this light would indicate to the receiver is they just need to put that USB into their computer. They don't need a, a, a login. It will automatically upload that data and fill in the gaps into our RouteWatch platform. Um, all of our devices uh, do have our secure flight technology, which allows them to uh, be used on board aircraft. And then uh, because it's disposable, there's no really device management. It has a two year shelf life uh, and there's no charging. So it's a very simple device to use, um, very user friendly and obviously very popular around the world. Although uh, we are discussing air shipments, um, the entire global supply chain is, is really uh, facing struggles. Um, and in order to help our customers solve those problems, we have a family of devices 
uh, based on the mode of transportation, whether it's ground, sea, air, or a combination of any of those. And you see those devices in the picture. Um, with the challenges that we've all faced with COVID-19, um, it really, I think, opens our eyes through a lot of layers of, of organizations. And as we go forward, I, I believe I'll, I'll end with this. There's three really important questions that we need to ask ourselves. One, um, how are we protecting our brand? Um, is technology a part of our risk management program? And are we prepared for the next supply chain disruption? Because we know there will be one, whether it's weather or, or any type of delays, we, we must be prepared. So um, that's the end of my presentation. Questions are welcomed. I appreciate this time. And uh, there's the details should anybody need to contact us. Thank you very much. Well, good morning. Again, my name is Jeff. Um, thank you, uh, guys, for you know listening in to Jeff's uh, presentation. Um, I'd like to share some questions at this uh, point uh, from our viewers. So uh, the first question uh, that I have is from Danny. Uh, she asks, "What do you see as the service gap in cold chain freight management?" or sorry, movement. So uh, perhaps, uh, you know, one, uh, someone could take the question, uh, Rosalind? Well, I'm trying to understand what, the, what does she mean by cold chain gap? <laughs> um, the service gap in cold chain freight movement. Service gap, because, yeah. Um, we have very big definition. I mean, we have a lot of definition and every company have their own service and quality okay. definition. What is the requirements of coaching? Mm -hmm. So um, I believe the biggest coach, I'm not sure what's coaching yet, but we do have, each of us do have our coaching uh, service challenges. So maybe just to share during this COVID uh, coaching challenges, we have this, um, we, we, the focus on air or ocean? Um, air. Okay. Yeah. For air, currently, I will say, um, are the airlines availability? Because a lot of airlines currently have a lot of blank uh, cancels uh, cancel. So, as a beggar, we are we cannot choose. So, whatever you, nowadays is whatever airlines there is, uh, we have to write on it. So, but not all airlines are cold change uh, or, or pharma trained or they, they have good pharma knowledge. So it, it, uh, it becomes for us that we have to take a lot of uh, precautions to protect our products if we decided to use them. So like uh, whether what kind of pa packaging uh, technology we need to use to protect, we need all need to upgrade. When we, did, we use certain um, airlines that we are not familiar with or we didn't do any name risk assessment with them. So the decision journey there, we upgrade a lot of our pack, packing technology, um, upgrade a lot of service level that certain cargo that we don't use, uh, uh, that we depend on packing technology, but use general cargo. Now we have to all upgrade to two to eight or 15 to 25, depending on the lane. And um, honestly, we don't use uh, GPS, uh, IoT devices in all our shipments, only selected shipments that are very high in value, or we know that certain lanes or routings that has um, has challenges or high temperature excursion risk. But now we we try to use almost for um, certain allies that we never used before during this period or certain routings that are new to us that we have never validated to further protect our products. So I would say the gap is um, the allies that are currently available now that are Pharma train is limited. Then the second gap for coaching during this period is um, destination um, terminals capability. So when you arrive there, most of the time due to the heavy backlog 
um, a lot of um, destination airport, they cannot guarantee there are cold chain facilities available or they can give the kind of attention that they used to have for, for the pharma grade kind of service. So it becomes that we, the, the IoT device, the real-time devices become very important. How your packaging technology becomes really important and your liaising with your custom brokerage at the destination become very important. The how fast they can clear it out and all the backlogs. These are the current gap that we see in, and, the, and there's also one thing we miss out is the in-market distribution. Due to current COVID, uh, now it's getting better. We have a lot of shortage of drivers at the end, brokerage at the end. <laughs> What you used to can clear out in one day or two days now maybe takes even longer. So besides the effort, you still need to look at the final mile, how you're going to get it out to your patient. So these are the whole air supply gaps that we are working on and try to mitigate all the risks. And, uh, Sanjay, I actually see that you know uh, you are in agreement to quite a lot of what uh, Roslyn shared. So uh, perhaps you could share as well a little bit on your perspective. Yeah, I think I'd just like to extend what Roslyn just mentioned. She aptly said that the biggest challenge was the availability of the um, the air freight capacity, right? That was that was the big key challenge. But the second uh, extension to that is. And this is an interesting, some of the interesting examples of which we really lived at this point of time. So one is once the cargo reached the destination, as Rosalind mentioned, so uh, the availability of the customs official in many countries because of social distancing, uh, the, the availability of the customs official to handle the pressure in terms of clearance perspective where had, was a challenge. Terminal handling agents, uh, literally because of social distancing, many of these people were scared even to come to the terminals to handle the products. So those are some of the interesting challenges that came across. And cold chain, you know, and prioritizing. So literally like your cold chain shipments are pretty much in the same category as the general shipments and, and, and differentiating that was becoming a huge challenge because you have to literally, like if I was, uh, my team was spending probably a couple of hour, uh, hours to manage a particular end-to-end uh, -end shipment. Now they're spending multiple hours to, because they have to coordinate with multiple people at any given point of time to coordinate that. Last but not the least, the trucking, the last mile delivery piece of it was an interesting part also because since the availability of the truck drivers was a challenge, I, was, I remember in one of our studies, we actually had to use ambulances to deliver the drugs to the patient's uh, home because there were regular trucks that were not available. We had to literally uh, request the hospitals to allow us to use some of those ambulances where some of our uh, carriers actually, some of, and, and thanks to some of our partners who worked very closely with us uh, from the integrator's perspective, who worked hand in hand with those and then we delivered the drugs to the patient's home because they were cold chain shipments. They had to be delivered in a particular span of time and had to be not only delivered, but also uh, uh, dispensed and, 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 and injected into the patients as well, along with the nursing uh, perspective. So those are some of the additional challenges uh, that added to the complexity with this whole challenge situation. Uh, to add on to uh, the question, uh, you know, uh, she sent in a, a, a follow-up for uh, 7P. Uh, you know, she wants to know whether your device is uh, airline approved and whether the uh, data and transmission is approved by regulators in countries uh, like China. Yes, thank you. So our device does operate with Secure Flight, which is our uh, mode that our devices enter automatically. It is um, built to be FAA EASA compliant and we work with airlines all over the world to gain approvals. Um, the device itself will uh, suppress transmissions during flight and then once the uh, device comes off the aircraft, gains a signal, goes through its checks and balances and then transmits all the stored data. So uh, it will automatically fill in the gap from the flight. And then um, as far as working in China, the devices do go, uh, are approved to go into China. We have some Chinese um, airlines approved and the devices can terminate or originate there. Uh, we're doing that today um, on our platform. So. For our customers operating within China, we have dedicated servers uh, that utilize um, that 
allow them to operate uh, independently um, or globally, and then also utilize the Chinese um, uh, created maps. So it's uh, uh, and the platform itself is is uh, also translated into 16 different languages currently today. So it can support uh, support those Chinese customers as well. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Derek. So uh, another question that we uh, got was, what service uh, providers uh, currently are giving uh, the most reliable um, and economic uh, connectivity uh, to a global cellular network for IoT devices? So uh, would anyone like to take this uh, question? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so there, would you be able to uh, share a little bit about um, the providers that you're working with uh, with regards to, you know, um, IoT devices? Oh, well, uh, at this moment, we are not doing it uh, because uh, IoT is something which is, uh, you know, uh, going to be quite expensive. And therefore, we are actually thinking about uh, uh, you know, finding out uh, some kind of uh, service providers. But as of now, what we are doing basically with the data loggers at the moment. And uh, uh, in fact, in case of data loggers are, uh, you know, helping us uh, pretty good because uh, what happened in case of a data logger, sometime it could be going out there and the reverse logistic is not passable. Uh, so we are finding out ways and means as to how we can get it uh, reversed. Uh, so for that matter, all these data loggers are getting accumulated at one place in, say, for example, in the case of US, uh, where we are supplying, and then coming back through our partners like DHL or FedEx, uh, that kind of arrangement that we have done. But IoT is something which, uh, at the moment, we are not using it. So I'll just uh, add to this, uh, Kashmir, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, okay. And, uh, you know, technology and IoT devices are pretty interesting because we, we are relying pretty extensively on those, especially for, because for us, uh, as uh, it's not a volume that matters, right? It is because each of these drug studies are smaller volume. They have to reach to the investigator side. The patients have to get dispensed. Um, and as I think it was interesting to hear Derek uh, to talk about their solutions as well. I think um, we do use a lot of data loggers during our shipment. But uh, interesting enough, in addition to the data loggers, are today technology available um, in terms of impact monitoring and overall shipment monitoring also. And we have tried some of those. When I say impact monitoring, there are today devices that are available that technically can go inside a blister pack of a, of, of a drug. Um, now, the challenge in many of these devices always happens to be the battery life because there is a certain restriction during which the transition is happening. The other challenge, as Derek has also mentioned, was about uh, most of these devices are near real time. So not uh, because the, the challenge is not the device's capability. I think the challenge is with, is with the FAA and the IATA guidelines because they don't allow transmission of uh, real-time data when it's in, in, in the flight uh, because that has to be maintained. So it's only like as soon as it gets into the belly, all most of these devices turn off themselves. And then as soon as it gets out of the belly, it turns on automatically. Um, interesting to see that 7P has come up with a solution of disposable uh, so that there is no challenge of reverse logistics piece of it. But having said that, uh, uh, I think, as I said, uh, and I'm coming back to the question, uh, most of these devices uh, are, are, are pretty reliable, but the question is, what is the real need and the applicability and what is the objective that you're trying to achieve with these IoT devices? So for example, in a clinical study conduct, for me, my biggest challenge is to ensure that the drug, uh, because many a times the drug is shipped either from the warehouse or the depot to the patient, or sometimes from the investigator side to the uh, patient. Now the challenge is if it's going from an investigator side to the patient, I have to ensure that my career partner is working in a tandem and making sure that the passive packaging or the cold chain box that he's using and the devices that he's using are all calibered at the point of the pickup of the shipment from the sites because many of these hospitals have no clue of how to create a cold chain packaging. If it's happening at the depot, great. Uh, the warehouse guys are experts on that. They are trained in terms of the, because these people at the sites are all doctors and nurses. They're picking up. So I'm making sure that you have proper partners who understand the technology piece, how to use the platform is one. The second interesting piece in many of these IoT devices is the transmission capabilities. So as I said, that uh, uh, on-road 
uh, in the belly, off-road. And then once the product reaches a particular uh, destination, now in a finished product, it's easy because once you reach at the destination, you can always restore and store it in a cold chain chambers. But in a clinical study, once the product reaches, it's sitting at the pharmacy. And whether the pharmacy has the ability to maintain that product and continue to maintain that product in a particular temperature. So the ability of a particular device to continue to monitor the temperature inside the refrigerator of a pharmacist is also going to be critical importance because whether the product is, because finally the product is consumed by an end patient and whether it is, has the right efficacy or not. The other challenges we have seen is many of these pharmacies are actually in the basements of many of the hospitals. And the moment it's in the basement, the transmission of the GPS also has challenges. Uh, uh, and that is another challenge that I've seen from a uh, service reliability perspective. And no service provider actually can, uh, it depends on who GSM, who the GSM provider is at that point of time, how strong the Wi-Fi is. Um, are you using a combination of GSM and Bluetooth? Then it's a different story because some of these devices have the ability to use both. Some of these devices only depend on the GSM piece of it. If it's only GSM and if there is no restriction, no cell tower, then again, a challenge of, uh, then the only time you can get the data, the data is still being captured, but the only time you can get in data is once the product is out and comes in an area where the cell tower is again available. Uh, maybe when it's been dispensed to the patient. So I think all these parameters play a very critical role in making sure that how you plan, which is why I come to the fact that I think the important question here to ask is what is the objective and the end objective that you're trying to use an IoT device for and is it fulfilling that? Um, and, and, and then map your entire supply chain from start to end that way, where are the places where the product is going to stop and uh, go and dispense? And I think mapping that is going to be important for in order to come to a conclusion, in order to develop a device strategy accordingly. So that's just two cents from my end. Uh, so I just wanted to, uh, you know, tap into something you said about uh, the GPS uh, tracking. Um, so we, uh, this is in line with the question that uh, was also uh, posed by a viewer. Um, you know, uh, what? How do you intervene? Uh, you know, when a shipment, uh, you know, expresses an uh, automated signal uh, that indicates a problem. Uh, what are uh, what are your methods for intervening in such a case? And you mentioned that you know uh, the pharmacies are in a um, are often the basements of uh, hospitals, so uh, you do you do not get the information at that point in time. So uh, yeah, perhaps you could share the inf intervention strategies that you have. So I'll give you an extreme example because I'm sure Rosaline would have had that experiences as well. Uh, interventions in most of the time with the airlines is very, very difficult, especially when the product is on the move. As I said, uh, if the product is on the move and something happens in the air, there's no way you can do anything about it. There's no way you can connect to the pilot and say, hey, you know, can you go and check my cargo in the belly space? It's just not going to happen. And nobody has been able to come around with that particular solution till date. At least I have not come across. Maybe I still need to be get, uh, If there is something else in the market, I would love to hear about it. But, uh, but having said that, uh, the way we work is, and um, very similar to some of the solutions that's uh, 70 team has mentioned, uh, we use a system called the uh, active tracking. Now, what it does is we have an inventory management system that sits in our warehouse that technically has, uh, so all the data loggers that have been transmitted, the, uh, our, our, techno our inventory management system is connected with that platform. So uh, the real time data, data as it comes while it's on the road, that data has been transmitted through our system. Now in clinical study, you have to understand that there are multiple systems that have been used to conduct a study. So one is the inventory management system for the drug supply, but there is a system called randomization, RTSM. Technically, that system is used to randomize the patient. So which patient will get which dose, you know, like a, um, is, is decided in that system. Now, the interesting part is what we did in Paracel was we, we have an ability to integrate the data that we receive from the loggers into both the systems simultaneously because the randomization system is sitting at the investigator site. Uh, because they use the system to dispense the drug, take the uh, drug from the pharmacy and dispense the drug to the patient. And we have also, also have a mobile app for that randomization system. So what happens is if a shipment is on the way, a temperature excursion takes place. We definitely get a red alert into our inventory management system. Now, hopefully if it is on the road or it's at the tarmac or wherever it is at that point of time, um, and it does give an indication that the temperature excursion has happened, but simultaneously a similar indication goes into the RTSM system and to the mobile app. So what happens is what we do is we immediately dispatch another batch of shipment. 
uh, without even waiting for it. And what happens at that point of time? The reason is because we are dealing with very limited quantity, and 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 if the if if that molecule gets uh, compromised, we are dealing with the patient's life at the end of the day, right? Because that drug is going to be dispensed, so we cannot uh, uh, manage any kind of complications that are there. So what happens is simultaneously the same temperature excursion data goes into the randomization system, and the moment if the investigator site receives the drug at his site uh, and he scans the barcode. As soon as he scans the barcode, immediately the red alert comes to on his app saying that, hey, this, stem, uh, this shipment has a potential excursion, please quarantine it immediately. So they need to quarantine that. So the pharmacist quarantines it, it keeps, uh, uh, keeps it aside. And then a message pops up saying that another shipment is on the way. And, and, and that's, that's what we do it. And that's how we manage our exceptions at this point of time. So I, I don't know if that helps, uh, but that's... that's no, 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 that, that is uh, definitely in, in interesting how you guys are going about it. Um, and yeah, at the end of the day, you you are dealing with uh, drugs that are going to go into the patients quite immediately. And so uh, you, the response time is not very uh, you know lo uh, long. So you have to have uh, such a intervention method, I suppose. Um, how about... I know? The only thing is, as I said, we don't have the luxury as a finished product. It normally is anywhere between three to five to seven days time, or normally 10 to 15 days is what the max that normally the product sits in the investigator site. So unlike in the standard uh, finished product, because as I said, I've been in my past life, I've been dealing with the downstream of the supply chain very effectively. Uh, so that's what it makes it uh, easier, but it's still challenging as Rosalind mentioned that even when the product comes in, um, you have to first ensure that the temperature data has been collected and then only then the quality will release the product to be then dispatched and sent to the final uh, pharmacists or uh, those patients. So there's not much difference. It's just the matter of timing is what, what makes it difficult. Okay. And uh, so th th this is from a clinical uh, perspective, the clinical trial perspective. How about, you know, uh, Sudhir and, and Rosden from, from a finished uh, product uh, perspective, you know, how do you deal with intervention uh, strategies uh, for you know, GPS, uh, you know, tracking solutions? Okay, uh, uh, we have both. We use in both our show, so we focus on air. Oceans is a bit more difficult. Yes, uh, yeah, right. So for for air, it depends where the the, the temperature excursion happens. Origin, if it's origin destination, yes, but during in transit is the challenge. We cannot stop the pilot, but. The good thing about finished goods or certain product, we have uh, what we call stability study. So as long as uh, even with excursion is within the stability study within like how many hours, we still have uh, supporting um, data to, to do a quality release. So if it's in transit, as long as it's not within certain, so also we can have a risk mitigation plan. Once it touched down, what are the our our partners are supposed to do at the at the ground as long as it doesn't exceed the number of hours of the stability study. So so that is what we call our intervention. So for example, if this product is say uh, a two to eight product, and we are using a pack out uh, a pa packaging technology to move it at fifteen to twenty five. So if there's a temperature excursion, the moment it hits the destination, we say straight away put the product into a uh, two two to eight. Facility. For example, that's an example of the risk mitigation, so that uh, they know how to handle the moment the aircraft touch down, and they need to give additional and then so to reduce the number of hours that is left at tarmac or during in transit. What are the, the handling uh, or storage temperature they need to do? Maybe a change to from a fifteen to twenty five to store it two to eight or from a two to eight to store it into a, a minus zero, depending on your. We need to take into consideration on the pack, uh, packing technology and everything. So that's, that's what I meant by intervention plan. When, like, if it's the, the um, when you reach destination, we know that, oh, why the ground handler, our, the, the instruction we give is to ship it as to do it. Then we realize at destination, why our temperature in the real time or GPS is going up. Then we realize it doesn't make sense. They are not storing at two to eight facility. Then we, the, the, all the alerts like we have, phone apps and everything, emails and alerts and phone calls. We even have WhatsApp group, real, real life monitoring that you can log in on your phone and everything we have. It, it's how we use, it depends on the user and, and the distribution list that you send all these alerts to. So um, what we did is uh, for all this, they, they will send all these alerts. We, we do have what we call the intervention. What are our partners like uh, all your 
supply chain partners like your, your freight forwarders or whatever you call them, the 3PL or 4 p what are the uh, exception handling they all, all these are in place. It depends. And uh, so you, you've, uh, you know, shared from the uh, air um, freight perspective, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how about uh, Sudhir, maybe you can share because you, you, you've uh, you know, gone the sea route uh, in terms of uh, moving forward. So uh, perhaps, you know, you could share a little bit about uh, the intervention strategies that you guys have in place uh, should such a issue occur with regards to GPS uh, tracking uh, temperature excursions. Uh, well, <clears throat> as I said, like in terms of, uh, you know, temperature exertion exercise, we are using data logger, which is actually placed uh, uh, with the corners uh, of the container because we just cannot afford uh, at this point of time to attach with every package. Uh, and that is uh, happening uh, fairly good. Uh, the only thing is that like while uh, the movement of truck can be monitored through GPS during the you know, road transportation and uh, up to a certain extent at the port, uh, and at destination, uh, the data logger exercise or data can be retrieved only when the consignment would reach out there in the warehouse. And in the process, if it is going to happen that some accession happened, uh, it's uh, really uh, difficult actually to what to do. So there are two, three things that we are doing. One is we take the total history with our service providers as to how many temperature extension are happening pertaining to a supplier A, B, and C. Wherever there is a unreliability that we have to take it up uh, with the service provider and find out what are the reason to get the mitigation plan, how did it happen, and five by analysis, so uh, four by, uh, four W and one H uh, analysis or something like that. And uh, it is happening. Uh, secondly, that uh, we have to, uh, have a stability data readily available, wherein uh, we have to see as to whatever the temperature accession happened for how many degrees or how many time, uh, how many long duration is something we have to take it up from the stability data. Uh, so in the worst case scenario, if it is actually beyond the stability data, uh, something that uh, we have no option but to scrap it, and then uh, sometime we have to take it uh, to the service provider in order to, you know, make them more alert. Uh, so otherwise uh, we, as I said, uh, we have to have uh, uh, some kind of inventory so that you know, the material can be supplied from that inventory and data it can be you know, replenished. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much, uh, Sudhir. And uh, so I also like to ask uh, Derek, because you know you deal with real-time uh, monitoring uh, devices, uh, in this situation uh, where uh, you know there is a <clears throat> issue uh, in terms of the uh, GPS tracking, and uh, you know there is a need to intervene, uh, how do you guys uh, go about advising um, as such, or maybe you have a solution, uh, you know, on your end? Yeah, so there's a few different things that that we always try to to get customers and and um, to 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 understand. First and foremost is, you know, you have to have a plan. Um, how do you react to that is going to be based on the type of product it is, uh, the shipping environment, the mode of transport. Is it a known carrier versus, um, you know, a, a third party carrier? Uh, there's a lot of different things to take into account. So one of the things that we we provide on our system is the ability to customize certain fields. And Rosalind kind of mentioned it with, um, you know, having stability reporting uh, and tracking there. So in our platform, you have the ability to create specialized pro, um, drug profiles or in, in, in her term, uh, a stability report that's gonna let you know the amount of time uh, that a product's out versus the viability of that drug or product uh, based on the amount of time it's been out. Um, you have different ranges of excursions that are going to cause, you know, one product could, if it goes out for more than an hour, it's no longer viable. So uh, as Sanjay mentioned, uh, you're going to have to dispatch a different uh, a product and, you know, a replacement. And what we've provided is those tools and the guidelines um, just based on our knowledge of pharmaceutical supply chain. So before 
we did GPS tracking. Jeff and I met um, in an air freight company. <laughs> so air freight has been my, I thought I got out of air freight, but uh, you know, essentially I'm still here. I'm never going to leave transportation. Um, but uh, that perspective and, and that, that past gives me the ability to understand the challenges that everybody watching and everybody else in the panel is experiencing. Um, and we built the tools in our platform to customize that to each customer uh, and product requirements. So is it having our 24 seven command center reacting to a, uh, an excursion and then following that process, that call tree or protocol uh, for that product or that customer? Or is it going into a security or a monitoring uh, in-house team that our customer is doing on their own and that integration into their system is providing those tools and that information. So in those instances, it's always important to understand first and foremost, what my opinion is, is it a known supply chain or is it something outside of the norm? And what everybody's facing right now is we're, we're seeing that uh, you've heard it here that you're utilizing pretty much any carrier, any airline that you can right now. So having the system to not only provide the alert, but that additional data uh, surrounded specific to that product is, is what's important. Um, Sanjay was talking earlier about, um, you know, having a device doesn't really give you a lot of information unless you know how to use that tool. And he mentioned um, uh, deliveries going into labs. Uh, in basements, and that's when we designed our disposable device. We designed it with with that in mind: clinical drug trials, uh, pharmacy shipments, um, and one of the things that we built in there, and, and you may have noticed in the video, is a data a data LED, and that LED is telling the end user, with or without signal, um, if there is data stored. So if it's going in the refrigerator, and you pull that out, and there's no data. You don't have to go and take it outside and get a signal. You simply plug it into your computer and you click a link and it uploads that file and it lets you know if it's viable. In addition to that, the there is a an LED indicator to the end user, regardless if it's a finished product, uh, direct to patient shipment or a clinical trial that indicates right there on the device that there is an excursion that's that has occurred with the temperature. And the last thing that we've built into the device is a light sensor. Uh, a lot of people ask why we have a light sensor. There's a lot of different things for that, but most importantly is to know if that carton has been open. You know, those, those hold times that are validated on these shippers are validated based on a lot of different things. And opening up a 96 hour hold time, um, maybe it's a customs inspection or, you know, a airway bill, fell off of it and people are trying to figure out what's going on. That alert letting you know that's been open and seeing that temperature spike in the chart associated with the light lets you, not, lets you know not only that the device uh, is indicating a temperature rise, but in conjunction with that, you have a light sensor. So that means the product has been opened. Um, in a lot of instances with certain products, if there's exposure to it, it can cause a lot of problems. So we've built that in conjunction with that to mark it on the report so you know if that um, if that carton or that pallet or that container has been opened in transit as well. And that's important uh, for a lot of different things. So uh, biggest thing is just really understanding uh, and, and having a, play, uh, a process put in place first before you just throw a device on a shipment. That doesn't do you a whole lot of good if you don't have, you know, a QMS designed around not only you have a QMS for every product that you're shipping, every process, every shipper, you need to have one for the GPS device and how you're going to use it as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Derek. So um, thank you all for, you know, addressing some of the queries that our viewers had. Uh, this has been a fruitful discussion and, uh, you know, to our viewers, I hope that you managed to glean some answers uh, to the questions that you had. Um, in the interest of uh, time, we'll be wrapping up the Q&A uh, session here. Uh, if 
you have any further questions, please feel free to drop me an email. Uh, our panelists uh, will get back to you with regards to the remaining questions uh, and their answers to them uh, you know, in a separate email. So before we wrap up today's session, I'd like to take a moment to highlight two of our upcoming live interviews namely on the topic of uh, developing standardized animal models uh, to evaluate the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine effectiveness, um, which will be on the 28th of May, and managing your shipping of emergency medicines, which will be on the 4th of June. So both will be live at 10.30 a.m. Uh, SGT. If you are keen to register, please do so on the link. Uh, on your screen as, or you can drop me an email to discuss further. So that brings us to the end of IMAPAC's first live moderated interview. I'd like to thank our moderator and panelists. Um, unfortunately, uh, Larry, who was supposed to you know, join us uh, as the moderator uh, from NextGen Consulting, uh, he had to attend to a personal uh, matter uh, that was of utmost importance. So he had to leave the uh, call prematurely. So uh, I'd like to, however, take this uh, moment to thank uh, the rest of you, uh, Sanjay Vyas, um, Rosalind Lee, Sudhir Mohan Bansal, and uh, Derek Middleton uh, for taking the time out today to join us and share uh, your insights on this pertinent topic. Uh, I'd like to also extend my gratitude to 7P Solutions for being our goal sponsor for uh, this interview. And last but not least, I'd like to thank our viewers uh, for spending your morning tuning into this interview. I hope you find this uh, found the session insightful, and I hope that you'll be tuning in to uh, future interviews as well. So till then, have a great day uh, and stay safe.